that will be the lesson for today. That's as much as I've got to say. <laughs> I'm sitting <down> there. <laughs> but I'm messing. <laughs> I'm playing with you. <clears throat> what, what we need to do now is uh, we need to turn to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. <clears throat> The first thing Jesus tells his disciples here is, I am the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser. <clears throat> you have to ask yourself, true in uh, compared to what? Uh, and the, the, the thing is that Israel was actually the vine in the Old Testament time. Uh, and uh, we can see that uh, if we turn now to Isaiah chapter 5. And verse 7, Isaiah chapter 5. <clears throat> verse 7 says, For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel, and the men of Judah his delightful plant. Thus he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed, for righteousness, but behold, a cry. There was high expectations with regard to Israel. They were the chosen people. And God looked to them to produce the fruit of their service to him. And that is, uh, that is holiness and righteousness and truth. Uh, and uh, it wasn't there. It just wasn't there. If we see... Uh, We'll see in this chapter, verses 1 through 6, how badly they had behaved. He says, let me sing now for my well-beloved, a song of my beloved concerning his vineyard. My well-beloved had a vineyard on a fertile hill. He dug it all around, removed its stones, planted it with the choicest vine, and he built a tower in the middle of it, and also hewed out a wine vat in it. Then he expected it to produce good grapes, but it produced only worthless ones. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard that I had not done in it? Why, when I expected it to produce good grapes, did it produce worthless ones? So now let me tell you what I'm going to do to my vineyard. I will remove its hedge and it will be consumed. And I will break down its walls and it will become trampled ground. I will lay it waste. It will not be pruned or hoed, but briars and thorns will come up. I will also charge or uh, yes charge the clouds to rain no rain on it for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel the men of Judah his delightful plant thus he looked for justice but behold bloodshed for righteousness but behold a cry of distress so <clears throat> this sums up the history of Israel right from the time he took them out of Egypt in through the wilderness. This is what happened. The majority of them turned their back on God. They lived for this world, for this life. They lived to serve themselves. They did not realize the responsibility that they had because they were the chosen people of God, because they were his vineyard. He did everything for them. Everything to make them productive. Productive of goodness and kindness, of truth, of righteousness, of holiness, of the fear of the Lord. He did everything he could to get them to the point to where they would be serving him and in their service glorify his name and be a witness to the whole world that there is a God in Israel. Now, I'm just doing this as background for us. 
we now, as Christians, are in the true vine. Not Israel, but Jesus Christ our Lord, Jesus Christ our Savior. We are in him, and we need to abide in him. And for all the reasons he's going to give just now, just keep it in your mind. As Christians, he has done everything he can to make you productive as a Christian, as a child of God. And we need to use whatever abilities, whatever facilities, whatever encouragement we can get from God, we need to use it all to build ourselves up so that we might become more and more faithful. The tendency is for us to become less and less faithful. We have to reverse that course and we have to become more and more faithful. And in order to do that, we need to abide in Christ. Let's read on now in uh, chapter 15. He says, Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. The pruning is like discipline. We do something wrong, we're disciplined by the consequences of that wrongdoing. But God expects us to learn something from those consequences. He, learned, he wants us to learn that he disapproves of the wrong that we have done. That he's not encouraging you to do, con continue in it and to do more wrong. He's trying to dissuade you to follow that path. And the consequence of our sin should shake us up and, and help us to see, look, I need to do something about what's happening in my life. It's falling apart. Uh, I'm suffering greatly or others are suffering greatly as a result of what I'm doing. This can't go on. I need to repent before God of the sins that I'm committing here. I need to ask God to help me to make the necessary changes so that I don't continue in that sin. And I need to devote myself or redevote myself to God and to carry a, carrying out God's will. So every branch then in Christ, he says, he takes away every branch that, uh, uh, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, sorry, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes it so that it may bear more fruit. You can be taken away from Christ. You can be broken off as a dead branch. Now there may be in our lives, we may be dying in terms of our spirituality. Eventually, the whole, the whole branch will be, will be dead, and then it will be useless. It will be broken off because it's not productive. That's a very serious thing to happen to anybody who has been in Christ and now will no longer be in Christ, will be broken off from that vine, only to end up in the fire. So he says, but every branch in me that bears fruit, he prunes that branch. He cleans, cleanses it. And we've described already how that happens. He said to the apostles, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. <clears throat> he who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit, for apart from you, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now that made, years ago, made a big impact on me. You want to do everything for Christ. You want to think that you've got the strength and the, the intelligence and the, the will to do great things for Christ. But the truth of the matter is, 
most of us have failed so badly along the way. Most of us haven't reached our potential at all. So we need to realize we need help. And that keeps us humble. We need help. I'm not going to achieve great things apart from Jesus Christ and apart from the help that Jesus Christ will give me. So I must rely on him to, to sustain me, to protect me. When I fall, to lift me up. When I get entrapped in sin, to deliver me from my sin, to forgive me of my sins, set me on the road again. If I have this sort of relationship with Christ Jesus our Lord, I, I will be the better for it. Rather than thinking, what else can I do for the Lord? And, and, and there's nothing wrong with thinking, what else can I do for the Lord? But always, un, un, don't overestimate your ability. Your ability to go it alone. Your ability to prove yourself to the world and to God. He knows what you are. You don't have to prove anything to him. You need his help. I need his help. Genuine Christians who know themselves and who know what, what this life is all about and what happens to us in this life know they need to rely on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Then we can bear much fruit. And you see, if he's helped us to bear that fruit, the credit doesn't come to, go to us. It goes to the one who's taken care of us. It goes to the one who has given us the strength and the desire to bear fruit. Israel, unfortunately, even in Jesus' time, even though they were still the vine of God before Jesus now takes that title for himself, they were at a point to where they had to make a decision between their Messiah who was among them or themselves. And they failed that test. Let's have a look at uh, Matthew chapter 21. Jesus told them this parable, which incidentally they understood, as we'll see by the end of it. It says in verse 33, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard and put a wall around it and dug a wine press in it and built a tower and rented it out to vine growers and went on a journey. <coughs> now, the, the overlap between what has been said here by Jesus and what was said by Isaiah in chapter 5 is easy to see. It's easy to see. But in this, in this instance, the owner of the vineyard went on a journey, so he rented the vineyard out to others. In other words, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the priests and all the, the hierarchy of, of Israel, the elders and so forth, they had the responsibility as those who were renting, as it were, the vineyard of the Lord to do what was necessary to make that a productive enterprise. Now let's see what happens. And when the harvest time approached, he sent his slaves to the vine growers to receive his produce. Well, they did produce, without a doubt they produced. The vine growers took his slave and beat one and killed another and stoned a third. Now, what had happened is in their selfishness and in their pride and in their arrogance against God, they decided that uh, when those slaves came, they weren't going to pay what was due to the owner of the vineyard. 
They thought they owned the vineyard. They thought it belonged to them. They thought everything about the vineyard was for their glory and their honour. They wanted to enrich themselves in the vineyard, but it wasn't their vineyard. And it's a mistake as well that we can make when the church starts to become successful, people will start to take uh, the applause for it and, uh, and, and the approval of it. And they will take it as a compliment for themselves, thinking that what a mighty job I've done here, what a, what a mighty job we've done here. And we, we start to think selfishly again. It's if there's any blessing, any glory, any development and growth, it is that it has come from the Lord, not from us. We played our part in it, but it's, it's due to him. God gives the growth. That's it. That's the message. That's what we need to get into our heads. Don't be doing it apart from God or from Jesus Christ our Lord or even from the Holy Spirit. We need the Godhead working on our behalf to achieve anything in this life. And particularly so with the church. So they stoned these men thinking the vineyard belonged to them. Again he sent another group of slaves larger than the first and did the, they did the same thing to them. This was rough. And of course, the, it corresponds to God sending them his prophets in the Old Testament and asking for what he, God asking for what was due him, the owner of the vineyard asking for what was due him. And they thought he, God doesn't do anything. We've done it all. So they killed the prophets, great men of God, who were trying to turn them away from the error of their ways and bring them back to God again. But they killed them rather than listen to them or change. In verse 37, but afterwards he sent his son to them, saying, they will respect my son. But when the wine growers saw the son, they said among themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and seize his inheritance. They took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Now Jesus asks a question to see what they would answer. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those vine growers? He's talking to people who understood who owns the land, who has the right to get the produce of the land, or at least some portion of that produce from the land of there, the owners. And that would uh, go for vineyards and, and, and all that. And they said to him, he will bring those wretches to a wretched end and will rent out the vineyard to other vine growers who will pay him the proceeds at the proper season. Ah, they knew, they understood what he was talking about. They put themselves in the place of the, of the one who owned the vineyard. They realized they had been taken advantage of. They realized that the people that had hired it out were unworthy people. They were selfish and greedy people. They did not want to know the owner, nor give him the share that was due him. And so they took the son and they killed him, thinking, well, now it's ours. We don't have to answer to anybody. Jesus said to them, did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? This became the chief cornerstone. This came about from the, from the Lord, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruit of it. Here was Jesus confronting them. It's going, the kingdom is going to be taken away from you. 
Now, they were the kingdom of God on earth at the time. The whole thing was a mess, a total failure. The kings had rebelled against God, except for a few. The overlords rebelled against God. The people rebelled against God. And this was the situation they were in. They wanted it for themselves. This land is our land. This is our kingdom. This is our future. And our children's future. And we'll secure whatever we need to do, even if it's killing off a few people to do it. He says... And he who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces, but on whomever it falls, it will scatter him like dust. Listen to verse 45. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard this parable, they understood that he was speaking about them. <laughs> See, they weren't stupid. They caught on. They understood what he was saying here, even though it was a parable. And he, they must have understood that he is coming as the son of the vineyard owner to collect what was due the vineyard owner. So they sought to seize him, but they feared the people because they considered him to be a prophet. So Israel was doomed God did take away the kingdom from them. And he's made Jesus Christ the vineyard and the vine and every other, the door, every other thing that means connection with God. Through Jesus Christ it comes. And in no other way, Israel has lost and has had lost forever it's right to that claim. And I'm saying that because there are many now who are turning their attention to Israel as a nation. It's as if they came back into the land the way they had come back from uh, previous captivities. It isn't so. It was never predicted that this would happen. It's happened. God allowed it to happen. But that doesn't mean they're the people of God only in the sense that they are the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And God has some concern for them because he still wants them to be saved. But to put our trust in a kingdom of this earth in Israel where the king would rule from Jerusalem just puts us back centuries in religious terms. We've learned nothing. On the human level, it is doomed to failure. It's a new spiritual kingdom in Jesus Christ our Lord that we inhabit. And it'll finally end up in its eternal phase in the heavenly realm after we have been raised from the dead, justified before the throne of Christ uh, and before the judgment seat and glorified in that our bodies will be transformed into the image of, the, the, of Jesus Christ our Lord or the glorified body of our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything is awaiting us, but we must abide in him. Let's go back to John chapter 15. <clears throat> Let's read from verse 9 now. Just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love, he says. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you 
and that your joy may be made full. We need to realize when Jesus said to the apostles that just as the Father has loved me, I also loved you. And they felt that love. When Peter realized that he had denounced Christ, three times denying that he even knew him, cursing and swearing at the end of the day to try and convict the people he had nothing at all to do with Jesus Christ. And Jesus happened to pass uh, by the place where Pe uh, Peter was. And it must have caught Peter's eyes because Peter broke down, went out and wept bitterly. He knew the love Christ had for him. And he knew the affection he had for Christ. So he wept bitterly. There is a love there for us, and it's an important love. It's, it's manifested itself in Jesus being willing to come down to this earth from the heavenly realm, from the glories of heaven, the worship of heaven, the splendor and majesty of the heavenly realm. He left it behind in order to come down here to this earth to take on our form and to give his life a ransom for us. Look at Romans chapter 5, 6 through 9. For while we are still helpless, or while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man. And James has mentioned this in his prayer this morning. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we are yet sinners, or were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now instead of the us there, say in your own mind, Christ died for me, which he did. We are among the us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. This, this love that we see presented by Jesus Christ our Lord is the godly love, the highest form of love, a self-sacrificing love, a willingness to put the other before self. To lose all for the other. And Christ was willing to do that for us. We cannot or should not underestimate the love of God. In this is love, not that we loved him, but that he loved us. This wasn't a movement of love on our part towards God. He loved us far beyond what we could have imagined. He loved us even while we were yet sinners in our worst condition, in the depths of despair. He loved us and was willing to give his life for us. Now in human terms, if we had that sort of love for each other, wouldn't it be great? Our love is selfish. We want returns on our love. And we want big returns before we start to give any love. And these returns must be sustainable. They must continue on. Otherwise, we'll stop loving because our, we love ourselves more than we love the other. Christ did not love himself more. He didn't even think his equality with God should be held on to. He sacrificed it all for us 
so that we would know how deep and how wide and how high the love of Christ is for each, each one of us. Each one of us. Let's look at John chapter 14. Here's the interaction that uh, should go on with, between us and Christ and us and the Father. He, verse 21, he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. I, I can't understand people saying we're saved by faith only without any works. Jesus says, he who keeps my commandments, they are works. They're not works of the law. They're not works of the flesh. They're works of faith. I'm doing these works because I believe in Jesus Christ. I believe in his authority, his right to command me as to what I should do. I'm responding in humility and submission and meekness towards Christ. I'm carrying out his will. I'm keeping his commandments. The one who keeps those commandments really loves God. Why? Because all of the commandments are centered around love. Whatever he's asked us to do, he's done it in love and he's done it for love. When we are to be righteous in our behavior towards God, it's only right that we should be righteous in our behavior towards God. God has rights. He is an infinite being who wants us to worship him. He has the right to be worshipped. When you refuse to worship Christ, you're refusing a right that he has. He desires in his heart that we worship him and we're refusing to give the one we're supposed to love what he desires. He doesn't ask much of us, but he desires for us to recognize who he is, how great he is, and what our responsibility is towards him as his people. We are to love God with all our hearts, with all our souls, with all our minds, and with all our strength. And we're to love our neighbor as ourselves. It's all wrapped up in the love. If we jump down to verse 23 now on John chapter 14, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our abode with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words. Now, if faith only keeps you from keeping God's commandments, it is a false teaching. He who does not lovely does, love me does not keep my commandments. If you're not prepared to keep his word, his commandments, if you're not prepared to subject yourself to his authority, you have not got the love in your heart for God. And you have not got the love of the Father. So it's important, it's really important for us to see that love, is, that love is central to our relationship with God Almighty and with Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, I have to say, I've been troubled by my own lackluster love of God. And I don't say that with any glee. That is a terrible reflection, but I'm telling you the truth, and God knows. 
It has made me question myself. And reading these verses and thinking about them and dwelling on them shows me that God loved me. And Jeremiah describes this love in the words of God as an everlasting love. It's a perfect love. It's everlasting love. It's as deep as God is deep and as holy as God is holy. And that is being poured out on me and on you day by day. The love of Jesus Christ is that self-sacrificial love, as we've seen already, willing to give everything to save our souls. The fact that he loved me before I loved him should mean something to me. Because when you start to feel um, doubts, should I say, about your own love towards him, the only thing that can keep you going is to think about, regardless of the deficiency of my love, his love is steadfast. His love is overwhelming. His love is dependable. His love will be faithfully continued in for the rest of eternity. I have to begin to think along those lines. And although I would doubt myself, I can count on the love of Christ or the love of God in Christ. And I can count on it being an everlasting love. So what I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is, I'm thinking to myself, this, this is my way out of the lackluster love. If I continue to allow these thoughts of God's love for me and let them overwhelm me and let them be, uh, live large in my mind and in my life, the more I think about it and dwell on it, the more chance there is of me responding to God in a fit and appropriate way, which is responding in love to him. So that would be the development in my love for God. And the more I sin, and the more I ask for forgiveness of sins, the more indebted I become to God, because he's forgiven, only forgiven me at a great cost to himself. But that cost was worth paying as far as Jesus Christ was concerned. There's a, a little verse in Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. Let's look over to Revelation. It says, I'm from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and released us from our sins by his blood. And he has made us to be a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Amen. What things God has done for us. Forgiveness of our sins. That's major. And by the time we leave this life, it'll be more major. Because I'm going to have to come to him many more times, I'm sure, before I take my last breath. But he's willing to forgive. And he made us a kingdom. 
We're the kingdom now, not Israel. The Christians are the Israel of God. But that's not excluding any Jew from it. Every Jew is invited to come into this kingdom. And I would wish that every Jew would be saved, as God did in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But unfortunately, that's not going to happen. I wish for everybody in Ireland to be saved, but that's not going to happen. Because they don't want to be saved. They don't want to know about God. They have no idea of the intensity of the love of God for them. And they turn their back on him and resist him to the very last breath. Only to find when they stand before him on the day of judgment to hear, depart from me. They partake of the second death because they would not listen or submit or give way to the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at Revelation chapter 5, I think it is now. It says there in verse 9, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals. Jesus is the one who would break the seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. There's promises. There's there's great encouragement for, for us. Great encouragement for us. So we are to abide in Christ. As we saw from the first example, or where the disciples were told to go into a city when they went out to preach, find out who is worthy in that city, go to their house and stay there until they leave the city. The word stay there means abide. Abide in the house. You would know what that means. You would dwell in the house. You would remain in the house. You would continue in the house. Those are, that, this is what we need to be doing to be in a safe place when we're in Christ, we're in a safe place. And we need to make sure that we're in that safe place. Not only are we to abide in Jesus Christ, we are to abide in his love. We're to abide in his word. Let's look at John chapter 8 now, verses 31 and 32. John chapter 8. So Jesus was saying to those Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. These Jews believed what he was saying. I think when it says they believed him, it's different to saying they believed in him. But that's, we'll talk about that in another, at another time. The, the idea is, if now you continue in my word, if you abide in my word, if that word lives in you and you live in that word, and that world which that word creates for us, then you are truly disciples of mine, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. It's a terrific promise. Let's look at 2 John 9.
It says, anyone who goes too far and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who abides in the teaching, he is both the Father and the Son. If you look at verse 6, and this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in it. And that is, walk according to love. Loving the Father, loving Jesus Christ, loving the brethren, loving the lost who are, saved, who are, who are in this world. Uh, we just need to become loving people. And we do that by keeping the commandments of the Lord. So if we do not, if we go too far, in other words, go outside of the parameters of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, we do not have God. The one who remains within those parameters has both the Father and the Son. Again, big promises. I know most of us are trying to do what the Lord is asking us to do. I know every commandment of his is important to us. The fact that we're worshipping the way we're worshipping this morning proves that we are concerned about what he authorizes. From the, from the, from the scriptures, we take our lead so that we would worship God in spirit and in truth, and to do that, we would worship him in the way that we're worshiping him. We would sing songs of praises to his name. We will pray to him and glorify his most holy name. We will hear his word and respond to it in humility and meekness. We will remember the Lord's death on our behalf so that we will be ever grateful for what he's done for us and be reminded that we are under a new covenant where God will not take our sins into account anymore. We are blessed people. We'll give of our contribution because we want to tell God how, how wonderfully well he's blessed us with a wonderful world, a world that is so productive, there is enough food there for everyone, if it wasn't for the greed of men, every single human being could have enough food to live for the rest of their lives. That's how productive the earth is. We need to acknowledge that God gives us everything and we respond by giving back to him what he has given to us. And we gladly do it just to acknowledge his kindness and his goodness towards us. So we will keep his commandments. And these commandments are very important because they're not just the commandments of Christ, they're commandments of the Father himself. John chapter 12, 45 through 50. Jesus says, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come in to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. Now listen, listen what, he, what he's saying. The word that he was speaking to them will judge them on the last day. I'm taking this lesson from the word of God to present to you the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. These are the words that will judge you on the last day. Not Steve's thinking, God's word. This was what will judge you on the last day. And by that standard of measure, where would you stand if you died today? Where would you stand before God if you died today in regard to how you're implementing that word or not implementing that word in your life? How you're living for yourself rather than for Christ? How you're 
you, you are unconcerned about whether this law or this commandment is, is, is carried out or not carried out. You just couldn't be bothered. Well, one way or the other, you've condemned yourself. And he goes on to say, for I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life. These words are not only from the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, they're from the Holy Spirit as well. The whole Godhead is behind these words, this gospel that we have. And anybody who rejects this gospel will not have eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. And that should be the way for us as well. When we're, when we're talking to others about their salvation, give them book, chapter, and verse. Show them from the scripture what God says about the matter. Don't go by tradition or, or, or other things that draw people away from the gospel, the simple gospel that has been given to us. We need to abide in God's word. These are the words of eternal life. Your theology may help you, but it may turn you away from understanding the true teachings of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. When it does that, it is an enemy, not a friend. Okay, let's go to 1 John 3. 24. The one who keeps his commandments abides in him and he in him. We know by this that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. The spirit whom he has given us will teach us to be submissive to the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ, to accept his word, to carry it out in our lives, and to glorify God in this way. If you haven't got that spirit, you haven't got the spirit of God. Chapter 2, 3 through 6. <clears throat> By this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. See, people think, I know about Jesus Christ. I know about God. But that's not the knowledge that he's talking about here. Do you accept the authority of God? Do you accept the salvation that Jesus bought for you as the propitiation for our sins? Do you accept Jesus as the Son of God? Do you believe in him? Do you take his word seriously? Do you know him in that way? The one who says, I have come to know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. I don't know, I don't care how intellectual they are, I don't care how religious they are or how pious they behave. If they're not keeping his commandments, they do not know God and the truth is not in them. But whoever keeps his word in him, the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. Which gets us back to abiding in Jesus Christ. How do we abide in Jesus Christ unless we're in him? And the last question we need to ask is how do we get into Jesus Christ? Let's look Romans chapter 6, verse 3 for a start. 1 
Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Jesus Christ, how do you get into Jesus Christ? Well, Paul says those early Roman Christians got into Jesus Christ when they were baptized into Jesus Christ. <coughs> Is that good enough for you? Or do you want something else? Do you want to hear Luther on that? Do you want to hear Rome's authority on that? It's not the same thing. Rome has changed baptism from adult believers, repentant believers of adults into baptizing or christening a child by pouring water on an eight-day-old eight child and who doesn't know why it's happening, probably will cry while it's happening because they're afraid and they have much to be afraid of because it leads them astray from the truth of God that we as adults need to accept Jesus Christ and in his word we need to believe that he is the Lord of all, that he's come to save our souls. We need to repent of our sins. We need to be baptized for the forgiveness of our sins. And then we are in Christ. Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. Now most people will stop there. That's, you can't stop there. Paul didn't stop there. There is a full stop there, but it's not a full stop forever. You have to move on. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. All who are baptized into Christ have clothed this, your, yourself with Christ. And it says in verse 29, And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's descendants, heirs according to the promise. Paul describes what happened to him when he had been baptized. He says in Galatians chapter 5, uh, and uh, let's see. Hmm. No, that's not what I'm looking for. It's that, I, I'm, I've got the wrong. I've got the wrong scripture. Uh, the, but he, he says, uh, "I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live." Listen to this. Let's get back to what he's saying here. It is no longer I who live. Oh, but I'm still alive. I still want to do my own thing. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Who is first and foremost in my life? Who is the one that gets most thought about in my head? Who is the one who is most important it is Jesus Christ our Lord, and we must accept that. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. That's the way it is, and that's the way it should be. It's actually uh, Galatians chapter 2 uh, and verse 20. It's just come back to me. <laughs> Uh, sorry. I've been crucified with Christ and there's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live is in the flesh is by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. All right, so now we know. What does it mean to abide in Christ? It means that you are in Christ. It means you are in the love of God. It means you're in the word of God. That you've been baptized 
into Christ, that you have learned to love God because of what he's done for you and continue to allow that love to influence your response to him. Let it grow in your head. Let it be something of great magnitude for you. And let's become more Christ-like. God loves us with an everlasting love. We need to respond to that. We need to keep his commandments because they are eternal life for us. And that's what abiding in Christ means. I hope this has been helpful, and I hope it's an encouragement to you to do the right thing as far as Christ is concerned, and to be in the safest place that you can be in when it comes to all of the problems and the difficulties that are in this world, and when it comes to the end of this world, and when it comes to the judgment day, and when it comes to eternal life after that judgment, that's the safe place to be in, in Jesus Christ. Because all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places have been given to Jesus Christ, and Jesus is going to share all those spiritual blessings and with us, because we are part of him, we are in his body, we are his friends. We are a blessed people. I'll leave it there. Thank you.